Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fawn and London. In this episode we are going to be having a look at September's exceptional story, The Heretic of Hollow Street. But before I begin, I am going to do what I always do and tell you to play this yourself. It's much more fun to play it yourself and if you become an exceptional friend, you don't only get access to these exceptional stories once a month, you also get access to the House of Chimes, an expanded opportunity deck and a second candle, this thing up here, which lets you do a lot more in the game. So we're going to start in the season of propinquity. A voracious Marconian S has published a scandalous request in the London Gazette despite the pleas of her few remaining friends. She is looking for a companion for an exclusive dinner and could not give a fig for what remains of her reputation. Nobody of any consequence will be seen dead at dinner with me, she purred when approached for comment, so I must offer financial incentives to procure interesting company. All I require is that they have entertaining stories of an interpersonal nature to stimulate our table conversation. So far, no one has met her exacting requirements. Let's quickly do this. She has attracted a deluge of comment. In the gossip columns, she occupies more space than a rapacious landlord looking to maximize his property portfolio. The Marconian S has met the captivating princess only once. It was agreed that from then on, they would coordinate calendars to ensure that they never appeared at the same event again. But for the public good. Ah, wonderful. Let's unlock the Heretic of Hollow Street. Uh, it begins with shave and a haircut available anywhere in London. Shave and a haircut. Shave and a haircut. The voice of an entrepreneurial urchin rings down the street as she approaches bearing a threatening sheaf of pamphlets. She moves to intercept you, thrusting a pamphlet in your direction. New barber on Hollow Street, she declares. Hair today, gone tomorrow. Professional cuts at amateur prices. Tell your friends to visit Gosset and Flogs. Haircuts, shaves and other services available on request. Okay, let's, let's take the pamphlet. She is endeavouring to slide it into your coat pocket without you noticing. Cheers, says the entrepreneurial urchin. She heads up the street where you watch her fling the rest of the pamphlets over a fence and walk away whistling. You glance over the pamphlet in your hand. It offers nothing but prices, cheap, promises, ditto, and an address, Hollow Street, in Vale Garden. Though the barbershop can be found in Vale Garden. So let's travel to Vale Garden. So here we have the option to investigate the barbers on Hollow Street. The barbershop is wedged between a honey den and a bookshop that you suspect is a cover for another honey den. A sign overhead reads Gosset and Flog. A consummate coiffeur stands on the doorstep shouting and waving his comb for emphasis. The proprietor appears to have locked him out. We can either eavesdrop or we can ask him what's troubling him. Hmm. Hollow Street offers no shortage of dark alleyways in which to lurk and listen. Or we can ask him what's troubling him. The coiffeur is directing furious invective through the keyhole. We'll have to wait patiently for a chance to get a word in edgeways. Let's eavesdrop. The coiffeur is clearly a man who takes pride in his appearance. His moustache is carefully waxed. His clothes are spotless and starched, but his face is pallid and his hair has several strands out of place. I will not do this any longer, he shouts through the shop's keyhole. You ask too much of me. I'm done. Do you hear me? Consider this my notice of resignation. He strides away without looking back. A moment later, a notice is posted in the barbershop's window. Barber wanted. Must have all their fingers. Attached. No other qualifications necessary. Are we about to become a barber? <laughs> Wonderful. The door to Gosset and Flog is flung open, and you are welcomed inside by a man in a striped waistcoat with pins and airs glasses balanced precariously on his nose. He introduces himself as the barber. Give her a haircut, he asks, or are you just another dream adult addict? Because if so, I must say for the third time today that we are perhaps the only establishment on this street that is not secretly a honey den. How many secret honey dens are there in Vale Garden? <laughs> okay, so let's look around the shop. The ceiling is muffled with damp, something small and hairy scuttles around a corner. An ordinary barber shop, empty of customers and poor in hygiene. A wash basin sits in the corner, blades hang from the wall. A row of red cushioned armchairs sit before a wall of grimy mirrors. 
The shelves are stacked with jars of wax and bottles of laudanum. A pair of elderly ladies stand in the corner, each leaning on a broom. One releases a quiet snore. The small and hairy scuttling thing pokes its head back around the corner. It appears to be a bedraggled rodent. Hello, it says sullenly. My current employees, explains the barber, gesturing to the two old ladies and the rat. You notice that all the fingers on his hand, and the thumb too, have been amputated. They end just above the palm, in five circles of scar tissue. None of them can cut hair, unfortunately. I'm looking for someone to hire who can wield a razor with benevolent intent. There is an air of faint desperation about him. He shoots you an anxious grin. Well, you know, let's apply for the vacant position. The barber sighs with relief. At last, some brave soul answers the call, declares the barber. But I warn you, the barber's path is beset by thorns, my friend. He raises his hands, both of which entirely lack fingers or thumbs. See these? I lost them in a shaving accident. A terrible business. But I finished the customer's shave holding the razor between my teeth. After a solemn pause, the barber laughs and slips his hands back under his jacket. It was perhaps meant as a joke. Oh wow, this is a, there's a lot of options here. Okay, well, simple curiosity. You applied in order to discover the nature of the special services that Gosset and Flog advertises. I see, says the barber. Well, I appreciate your honesty, but I'm afraid that until I know I can trust you, you will only be cutting hair. Come to me when you wish to collect your tools. The barber has retreated to his back office. The Sonnenberry sweepers stand in the corner, upright and dozing as usual, leaning on their brooms. The shop is quiet. All the chairs are empty. The only sound is the sweepers' gentle snoring. Occasionally, someone will come in and ask about your other services, seeking honey or pleasure or some other illicit commodity. The barber invariably turns them away, telling them that they have got entirely the wrong idea and should be ashamed of themselves. The barber is waiting for you to collect your tools. So let's ask him for our tools. You find him in the back office, his feet on his desk and a grin on his face. With great solemnity, the barber reaches under his desk and retrieves a wooden chest. He opens the lid, revealing a pair of gleaming scissors resting upon a silk cushion. The exquisite scissors, says the barber in a hushed whisper. These are the blades that took my fingers all those years ago. Be careful with them. They are no ordinary scissors. They will cut through hair, through flesh, and through skull beneath without a whisper of resistance. He, his eyes glint as you pick up the scissors. I will have other equipment to give you once you've proven yourself worthy. I mean, the blades are made of mirrors. When you split them apart, your face looks back, perfectly halved. The sodden rodent is sitting at the window with a bottle and a monocular on the lookout for approaching danger. You've been assured that this is completely normal for a barbershop of good repute. Speak with the somnambulatory sweepers. They are almost identical, but not quite. One is taller, the other slightly plumper. One wears spectacles, the other a bonnet. You are polite, you are insistent, you even raise your voice. The sweepers doze on, swaying occasionally. The barber hears you and pops his head out of the back office. No use talking to them, he says helpfully. They're asleep. Well, uh, let's speak to the sodden rodent. It appears at your side when you call for it, clutching a thimble full of brandy between its paws. The rodent is small and bedraggled, wearing a tiny rifle strapped to its back. It glares at you and sniffs. What do you want, my lady? When you ask his role at the barbershop, he puffs out his chest. My job is to keep watch for thieves. Honey drinkers and cats of all sizes, he says proudly. He pulls the rifle from his back, and mimes taking a shot. If I see him enter, then bang, bang, right in the shins. I'll see him off. Wonderful. Oh, we can ask him about the other services again. The entrepreneurial urchin mentioned the barber offered some other services beyond mere haircuts. The act of trimming a fellow's hair possesses all the characteristics of a sacrificial rite, says the barber. The careful application of the blade, the anointment, the immersion in water, the mirror. After the process, the subject emerges in a new state, so to speak, transformed. The other service I hope to provide is a similar ritual. 
almost identical. I will tell you more when you have proven I can trust you. Okay, well, let's spread the word. Gosset and Flog, you appear to have run out of customers. You need to attract more if you want to raise the barber shop's reputation. The barber wants you to help build a reputation for his establishment. Of course, it is difficult to entice respectable customers out to a less than respectable place like Hollow Street. Ah, uh, recruit the entrepreneurial urchin to spread more pamphlets. Well, it worked for you, didn't it? Seems... True, I suppose? <laughs> Or we can take out an advertisement in a newspaper. Read all about it. If you succeed, this will attract more customers. If you fail, it will decrease the reputation of Gosset and Flog among the reading public. Let's, let's just pay for an advertisement, because the urchin chucked the pamphlets over the wall. You design a bold, simple advertisement that stands out from all the others crowded onto the black back pages in tiny font. You make promises that sound genuine, and even come up with a Pithy little slogan. The finest cuts, no ifs, no buts. Hopefully it catches someone's eye over their morning kippers. Well, we acquired some customers at least. Let's, uh, let's ask the sodden rodent for training in hairdressing before we uh, give haircuts to the current crop of customers. The rodent is willing to train you in the basics in exchange for a few bottles of his favorite variety of wine. The unimbinun kind. Yeah, okay, sure, why not? The rodent has never cut hair himself, but he carefully observed the consummate coiffure during his later short-lived employment. He takes you through some of the coiffer's techniques, occasionally pausing to swig from a bottle of wine taller than he is. On a side note, I know I've been saying this wrong, it's coiffeur, but it's French and I'm terrible. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go in there, give haircuts to the current crop of customers. How hard can it be? Because of your low skill, your efforts may not be satisfactory. Poor haircuts will do less for Gosset and Flog's reputation. Oh, I do have a skill with blades, right? Yeah. Okay, let's try. You wield the scissors with care and pause every few moments to check your handiwork. The haircuts you provide are not perfect, but they'll suffice. Your customers depart in better spirits than they entered. Once you are finished, the sweepers move forward with shocking speed and efficiency. Rooms whirling. The barber emerges from his sanctum, your payment in his fist. You gain one reputation for gossip and flog for every customer you attend to. Whoa, ten pennies. So that's a pretty good wage. Okay, let's spread the word again. And I can just use that money again. Have you design a bold, simple advertisement? we get more training? I don't know if this works. Let's ask if the rodent can train us more. Ooh. We can seek out the consummate coiffeur for further lessons. You'll need to leave the barbershop and head to a much more reputable hairdresser on Lady Bones Road. Let's try. You find him in much more pleasant establishment than the heretical barbers. The floors are gleaming and clean, the staff are continuously occupied, the coiffeur himself is whistling a merry tune as he combs a man's hair. When he first sees you, his whistling stops, and his eyes harden. He must have heard that you now work for the barber. So we can pay him, what does he want? He wants prescribed materials, ooh naughty boy. The coiffeur believes that the barber is bringing shame upon a noble profession but his convictions can be tempered by satisfying his appetite for lurid novalias. The coiffeur brings out the head of a mannequin, places a wig on its wooden scalp, and takes you through the basics of a decent haircut. When you show him what you've learned, he is horrified, more so when you tell him that you learned it from a rat. He declares that he has his work cut out for him. Okay, let's see if he can train us again. The coiffeur watches as you cut the mannequin's hair, occasionally sighing, occasionally grabbing your hands and guiding you with an airing precision. When you are finished, he grudgingly admits that you are improving. Again? The coiffeur watches as you cut the mannequin's hair, offering the occasional piece of sage advice. Think of the scissors an extension of your arm, he says, or better yet, think of your arm as merely an extension of the scissors. To cut well with the blade, he says, you must become the blade. One more? When you're finished with it, the mannequin looks remarkably dashing. 
Even the coiffeur is forced to admit you have talent. He says that you are finally ready for the next challenge, to cut the coiffeur's own immaculate hair. That seems like a really bad idea. He steals himself, gesturing towards his immaculate, luxurious locks. Improve on perfection, he commands you. You are ready for your final test. Your scissors flit like sparrows, your razor sings. When you are finished, the coiffeur turns his head this way and that, admiring your handiwork in the mirror. He doesn't express his satisfaction out loud. He doesn't need to. You will always be welcome back here, he tells you, shaking your hand. But a word of warning. The barber you work for now is not to be trusted. Why do you think he hides his maimed hands in his waistcoat? If you chance to see them in the mirror, you'll see that his reflection's hands are whole. Ooh. Interesting. What do we need? We need to get the reputation to 12. Okay, this is going to be quite a, uh, a little bit of work, I think. Oh, thanks to your skill with the blades, you don't need to worry about botching your haircuts. You wield the scissors with swiftness and surety now. As you show each customer your handiwork, they seem genuinely pleased rather than be begrudgingly accepting. You are getting to grips with the job. After the day's final cut, the sweepers move forward with alarming speed and efficiency brooms whirling. You wave the cheerful customer off, only to turn and find the barber watching you from his office. He gives you a single, solemn nod. Wonderful. Oh, that was easy. Uh, let's ask the barber to spill his secrets. You've helped build Gosset and Flogs into a thriving business. Are you ready to learn what other services the barber provides? The barber retrieves a wooden chest from his desk. He snaps open a pair of heavy bronze clasps. At Gosset and Flog, I don't want to confine us to cutting mere hair. We can offer the trimming of far greater nuance. He studies you for a moment. Imagine if we could cut away memories, the bad ones, that are like parasites with poisoned roots. Imagine the power we could wield, the good we could do. He turns the chest around and shows you what's inside. Inside the chest, nestled on a silk cushion, are two barber's tools. A simple, straight razor with an ivory-handled comb. Each is muffled with faint veins of not-quite-violet light. Don't stare at them for too long, says the barber. You will be using these tools to make the world a better place, but they are not safe to look upon for more than a minute or two. So we can either can we take both or can we have one or the other? Its handle is some kind of ivory carved with the image of a horse's head. I wonder if that means it's something to do with the fourth city. Or we can take the Nepothene razor, a simple little blade, but glints dangerously. I kind of want the comb. Like I'm drawn towards the knife, but the comb intrigues me. The what? You forget what you just took from the chest but it probably was of no importance, and can be safely disregarded for the foreseeable future. The innocuous comb, says the barber. It is possible to remember it if you concentrate, but it gives you a terrible migraine. I have not yet found a use for it, but perhaps it will come in handy one day. Looking down, you are surprised to see that you are still holding the comb in your hand. You slip it into your pocket, and there's a, there's a bulge in your pocket. Uh, funny that. Oh, we get to take the razor as well. A simple little blade, but glints dangerously. The Nepothene razor, says the barber reverently. It can cut a memory straight from a person's head. <laughs> You've acquired the Catholic razor, and there was something else, surely. I know this cove is going to give me endless entertainment. <laughs> the barber gives you a moment to examine the razor and the comb. They shimmer with a colour that leeches at your thoughts. Every time you glance down at the razor, it sears holes in your memory, forcing you to retch your gaze away and leaving you with conspicuous gaps in your recollection of the barber's next words. Down the street, a retired Zayla, terrible experience at Z, promised her a special appointment at o'clock. Yes, uh, whenever you're ready. The barber's smile is eager and his eyes calculating. Clear? Hmm. We have an option here. We can either do what he's saying, or we can object to the idea. So if we agree the razor is a tool that can sever one's ties to an unwelcome past, for some, this is exactly the service they require. 
Or we can say no, hacking away at someone's memories with a sharp implement is beyond the pale permission. Or no. I... This is a weird one, because if this was reality and you could take away people's bad memories, you'd solve a lot of problems. But then on the other hand, it kind of makes them who they are, so eh, who knows. Let's agree for now. The barber sighs with relief. The razor can accomplish great things for the benefit of mankind, he says. We can save people, like the Zayla, from the guilt that nips at their heels and thwarts their potential. You find her waiting in the back office of Gosset and Flog, sitting before a mirror, smoking a roll-your-own cigarette. Her face is older than her years, her eyes older than her face. The barber stands behind her. You need to talk about your memories and bring them to the surface, he tells her. Only then can we cut them away. She stubs out the cigarette. Get on with it, she mutters. It's better bloody work. We do have an option. We can either cut her hair or we can cut the memories. Take as many Z memories as you can, she says. Maybe then I can sleep at night without waking the neighbours. Let's, let's cut away our memories. I want to see where this goes. As you lift the razor, the bone-weary Zayla starts to talk, staring hollowly into the mirror. She tells dark tales from her time at Z. Pitiful stories of corpses fished from the water, of a hunger that hollowed her, of the wet, red, want that gnaws at her still. Unsure quite what to do, you make motions with the razor around her head. The barber watches, nodding eagerly. The Zayla keeps speaking. She is staring into the mirror, her eyes fixated on the razor's shimmering blade. You feel a slight resistance, as though you were cutting through a tangle of thorns. You make cutting motions with the razor until the Zayla's voice trails away mid-sentence. She stares at the blade in a silent trance. Can you remember why you are here? asks the barber. The Zayla remains silent until you've hidden the razor back inside its case. I am the foggiest, she admits finally. But it looks as though I've just had a very good haircut. Uh, so we can either tell her we, we removed her memories or we can tell her she just had an ordinary haircut. I think we'll tell her we had an ordinary haircut. Because she might get it. If, if somebody wants to have the memories removed and then you remove their memories, how do they know that you did what you said you were going to do and not do something else and then just remove the memory? So we're just going to pretend nothing happened. Yes, of course, says the Zayla uncertainly. I, I remember now. She pauses and a smile creeps across her face. I feel like I want to laugh. Maybe I'll go to the theatre and see a comedy. She stretches her mouth and grimaces. Feels like I needed it. She leaves the barbershop with a confident grin on her face. Her eyes are no longer hollow and haunted. They sparkle. When she is gone, the barber turns to you and clasps you in a spontaneous hug. Do you see, he asks, do you see how much we can help people? So continue to cut customers' memories and raise the barbershop's reputation to 30. Hmm. With the Zayla gone, the barber slumps back into his chair. The razor's purpose is to help those in need. This city is full of desperate of people desperate to forget. He pauses, flicking his gaze up to meet yours. But we can't save them all. Once we have established a reputation, there are three men in particular I want us to focus our eth efforts upon. Old friends of mine. I know the guilt they suffer. It is all consuming. I want to help them, if we can. Who are they, and why exactly do they require the attentions of the Razor? We met at university, says the barber. They were my first real friends. They befriended me even though I was just the kitchen boy. And they were the sons of gentlemen. He gazes fondly into the distance. They've achieved great things since I saw them last. One is a celebrated chemist at Benthic College, author of a dozen groundbreaking journals. I've read them all, though I haven't spoken to him since we parted ways in the Forgotten Quarter. What were you doing in the Forgotten Quarter? Oh, hang on. The barber moves on to talking about his other two friends, who are now respectively a surgeon for the royal family and a well-known master locksmith. He has followed the details of their careers intimately, though he claims not to have met them for years. When he is finished listing their accomplishments, he sits back and smiles warmly at his reflection in the mirror, radiating pride. So why did the barber and his friends part ways? I was giving a haircut to a particular client whose wisdom I had no reason to doubt, says the barber. He told me the location of a buried temple in the Forgotten Quarter in which 
could be found whatever secrets one might desire to know. My friends and I we were young and ambitious, and the other three had enough wealth to fund an expedition. He turns away from you with an almost imperceptible wince. It didn't end well, but I don't blame them for what they did. I want them to be able to forget their guilt and move on with their lives. The Razor can help them. Well, this seems like the perfect place to end the first episode. So, thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. And as always, I'll see you next time.